And welcome to tonight's event, uh, Reasons to Vote for Trump, featuring our special guest, Michael Knowles. My name is Daniel Tancredi, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of The Statesman and the Marketing Director of College Republicans. The Statesman is the truly independent student newspaper at the University of Pennsylvania. We stand for freedom of speech on campus and elsewhere, and <clears throat> value arguments not for their popularity, but for their merit. We espouse objectivity in reporting and passion in discourse on our journey to bring true diversity of thought to the University of Pennsylvania. In the last few months, we've grown exponentially. We've gone into print for the first time in years, doing so four, four times this semester. We've, we've had a much greater social media presence, and we've greatly expanded in the number of articles we've, uh, we've published. Now on to today, today's event, <laughs> which is going to be a lively and entertaining one, I'm sure. <laughs> Our goal with this event is to inspire the type of discourse that is and should be expected of an Ivy League university. How is, this, how is this discourse characterized? By openness, passion, and mutual respect. If, if this kind of discourse, this rigorous debate and discussion, is not, home at, the, is not at home at the university, university of Pennsylvania, then where will it be? American universities are and, are and should be <laughs> the bastion of free expression in the United States. And now I'm going to pass it on to Dominic, who's going to introduce tonight's speaker. You can tell that Daniel and I prepared to ramble for as long as possible in order to stall so that you could eat your pizza, but the internet connection did that for us. So I'll speak a little bit quicker. So hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. I am still Dominic, as Daniel said. We're really glad you could all make it out. And this is going to be a lively and entertaining debate. Yes, you can have a conversation with Michael when the Q&A starts. As Daniel said, the Statesman is a free speech society and a collegiate network publication here at Penn. Uh, we provide coverage, analysis, commentary, both on contemporary news and eternal ideas. Uh, we also do, if I may, constitute, we also constitute a small gaggle of deadbeat Cup Kake anti fans. Uh, Michael, for those who are uninformed, including Michael, this was Spring Fling. We had a, our opener called Cup Kake, yes. Her name, stage name is modeled after a vile sex act. So we constitute a small gaggle of devoted Cup Kake anti fans, except for Danielle, because Danielle is wrong. <laughs> Listeners out there, who wish to learn more of all this high quality content, proceed to statesmanonline.org. That's statesmanonline.org. Help Michael keep the lights on in the broom closet. Go to statesmanonline.org and support his sponsors. That's us. I also need to thank the College Republicans again uh, for in turn keeping our lights on um, and obviously uh, partnering with us to host this event. They're both keeping the lights on in Huntsman Hall and uh, pizza in your mouth. So thank you to the College Republicans. Of course, thank you to all of our other supporters. Uh, that includes the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. That includes the Collegiate Network and the Leadership Institute. Uh, because they back us, they therefore back this event. So we thank them for their support. Finally, I want to give, give one more shout out to Daniel Tancredi for a gorgeous layout on the fourth edition of the Statesman 2018 in print. Um, if you didn't grab a copy yet, feel, grab a copy on your way out of the Statesman's April issue and also the final issue of the semester. Yes, I would be willing to go so far as to say that this issue is lit. <laughs> uh, reminder to those out there online, do proceed to statesmanonline.org, smash that subscribe button, and also that donate button. <laughs> Finally, to proceed to the distinguished guest of the night, Michael Knowles, is a privileged coastal elite. <laughs> Born in New York, he attended Yale University, where he graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in History. In fact, he is a Bachelor of Arts in History. <laughs> he then pursued careers both in acting and in politics. He served John Huntsman Jr. for a time in 2012, 
uh, the son of the man who practically donated this building. Um, he landed employment finally uh, uh, at the Daily Wire after after a solid career as an A-list actor. Clearly, if you can take a look at his headshots on his website, that's the <laughs> prime indicator of an A-list actor. Uh, some of which I have included at the risk of copyright infringement lawsuits. Uh, this is Michael Knowles. Um, <laughs> So that's Michael Knowles lustfully reading the statesmanonline.org. <laughs> finally, 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 Michael has become the conservative political commentator employed by Ben Shapiro that we know and love today. It is my pleasure to advocate, by the way, that's me actually impersonating Michael Knowles on the love statue. And uh, it is my pleasure indeed to abdicate the throne to the managing editor of the Daily Wire, patriarch of Los Angeles, New York Times best-selling author of the shockingly blank book, Reasons to Vote for Democrats. His Holiness, Michael J. Knowles. How do I top that? What a magnificent introduction that was. <laughs> uh, it's very nice to be with you all tonight. Thank you so much for coming out. It is really nice to be here at Trump University to be here at the Wharton School of Business, the University of Pennsylvania, President Kofefe's alma mater, which we shall call Trump University for short. It's very nice to be here in Huntsman Hall. Uh, some people, I, I did, I worked for John Huntsman Jr. for a time in 2012, and you know, John Huntsman is President Trump's ambassador to Russia, which means that I was colluding with the Russians before it was cool. <laughs> I was very pleased about that. And, uh, if, if Mr. Mueller is watching tonight, because I know I probably have implicated myself in something, I am both sorry and relieved to say I have had no personal experiences with porn stars. Please leave me alone. Please do not raid my offices or anything like that. <laughs> so tonight, in Russian Ambassador Huntsman Hall, at the Trump University, we will discuss a very important topic, reasons to vote for Donald Trump. This sounds like the title of my blank book. I, I wrote a book that became a number one national bestseller called Reasons to Vote for Democrats, a Comprehensive Guide. It is, at the, at the risk of uh, being boastful, it is the greatest and most important and urgent political treatise of our generation. And, uh, what, but the difference in my talk this evening and in Reasons to Vote for Democrats is there will be words in this talk. There will be some of the best words, folks. Huge, <laughs> huge words, and I, I hope they're convincing. So the main reason to vote for Donald Trump, the main reason to vote for Donald Trump is because it makes Democrats cry and their salty, delicious leftist tears give me joy. That's, that's the, I could leave the speech at that, I think. That would be the main reason uh, that I'd do it. And that is not a joke. That's actually a morally serious statement. Be, I, I should be uh, specific. It, it makes Democrats cry and it makes the far left cry. And those were not always the same thing. There, there used to be Democrats who weren't uh, on the far left. Ronald Reagan was a Democrat. Scoop Jackson was a Democrat. Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Joe Manchin is like the last survivor of this ilk. They were all Democrats, but they weren't on the far left or the intersectional left as we call it today. That, that, uh, that difference has mostly evaporated. Today, there's very little distinction. Barack Obama campaigned and said, I want to be elected president so that I can fundamentally transform America. And I don't know about you, but I usually don't want to fundamentally transform things that I like or that I love. You know, I don't say to my fiance, sweet little Elise, I say, oh, honey, you know, I love you so much. I can't wait to fundamentally transform you. I want, at the very core of your being, I want you to be different than you are which is what our former president said of our beloved country. His wife, the former first lady, in a moment of accidental honesty, said she had never been proud of her country. She had never been proud of her country until the one time it made her husband president. That was the only time. And the first lady before that, the former future president, Hillary Clinton, uh, called half of her countrymen deplorable and irredeemable and apparently didn't like them very much. That is the Democrat Party today. That is why their salty, delicious leftist tears give me such joy and would be reason enough to vote for Donald Trump. But there are other reasons as well. Uh, this divides into two questions. 
reasons to vote for Donald Trump in 2016 and reasons to vote for Donald Trump in 2020. And let's take them in order. The reasons to vote for Donald Trump in 2016 are Hillary Clinton. That's the reason. It's like that book that she wrote, What Happened, Hillary Clinton. That's the only book that answers the question that it asks right there on the cover. That is the reason to vote for Donald Trump. Uh, he was much, much better than Hillary Rodham Clinton. Uh, Hillary Clinton openly campaigned on gutting the First and Second Amendments. This is not some conspiracy theory. This is not reading the, between the lines in some esoteric way. It was right there on her campaign website. She campaigned on gutting the First and Second Amendments. In fact, in order to gut the First Amendment and the right to political speech, she wanted to overturn a Supreme Court decision called Citizens United versus FEC. Citizens United versus FEC was literally a decision about whether or not one can criticize Hillary Clinton. It was a decision about her. In 2008, a conservative organization called Citizens United wanted to run a film that was critical of Hillary Clinton, and they were told they couldn't do it. Uh, a federal judge said that was not allowed 30 days before the Democrat primary that year. Luckily, it made it to the Supreme Court, and they decided correctly that uh, individuals do not surrender their constitutional rights when we organize in groups. We don't give away our rights to political speech just because we, we work with one another. To quote uh, Mitt Romney, corporations are people, my friend. You know, it's not like it's a building or something. We're people. We have those rights. She ran to gut it. Uh, same thing on the Second Amendment. She re the, the Second Amendment uh, preserves for Americans an individual right to keep and bear arms. This has not been controversial for m much of our history. It, it's necessary. It says, uh, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, listen, these are all Ivy League students here at Trump University. You all know how grammar and sentence structure works. The independent clause of that statement is, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The dependent clause, the justificatory clause of that statement is, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. Also, the, the reason it has to protect an individual right is that militiamen bring their own guns. They do that, they're not a standing army. They bring their own guns. So if you have a, a militia, that presupposes the people will bring their own guns. And furthermore, US code defines militia as virtually all able-bodied men. Uh, nevertheless, nevertheless, Hillary Clinton ran to overturn an important uh, victory for that constitutional right in Heller. These were major planks of her campaign. So what did Donald Trump campaign on? Well, he campaigned on protecting constitutional rights to begin, those two rights. He ran on reforming the tax code, making the U.S. more competitive. Uh, he ran on protecting life, protecting religious liberty. Uh, peace through strength, a foreign policy that was robust and would ensure the world peace and protect the world order. He ran uh, on enforcing immigration law, which is apparently now considered very cruel and, and awful. Uh, we can get into that perhaps in the, in the Q&A later. But he ran on saying to a, a free people, a sovereign people, uh, that yes, we will enforce the laws that have been passed democratically in this country, and you, the people of this country, get to decide who comes and goes and who uses certain benefits and, uh, and uh, will accept risks and responsibilities in that regard. Uh, Hillary said all of the opposite. She said all of the opposite. And those were pretty, pretty solid campaign promises. How about the slogans? The slogans tell us quite a lot. Hillary Clinton's slogan was, uh, I'm with her. The subject, of course, being me this little peon, this dependent American, and I'm with her, her wonderfulness. Donald Trump's was, I'm with you. The subject is Donald Trump, and you are the American people. It utterly inverted Hillary's awful uh, idea that she was going to be coronated. She was going to become the leader of the country. He said, no, I will be a public servant. I work for you. I serve you. I am with you. And if you don't like that, then you can throw me out next time. Uh, Hillary Clinton's other slogans were stronger together, which sounded very fascistic to me. If, you know, it's like a bundle of sticks, stronger together, and she's going to whack us on the head with it. Uh, another one was fighting for us. That one particularly scared me, because I wondered who us is. It seemed to me that if she's fighting for us, then she was fighting against them. And as a conservative American who's deplorable and irredeemable, uh, probably she's fighting against me. That's not very good at all either. And then the other slogan was love trumps hate, which I never understood, because that sounds like a pro-Trump slogan. Doesn't it? Love trumps hate. We're going to Trump, 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 you know. 
but uh, Hillary's never been a wonderful candidate or terribly competent at running uh, campaigns or federal agencies. More on that later. <laughs> Donald Trump's other slogans, other than I'm with you, were all basically variations on make America great again. Now you might say, oh, that's so, uh, so, I don't, but so blunt, it's so bleh, it's so no. That's a, that's a beautiful sentiment, make America great again. We want to make our country great again. Uh, there's a reason that it's a great slogan, and there's a reason that candidates have used it over time. Uh, Donald Trump borrowed it from Ronald Reagan, though there was a, these are different men, these were different times, so Ronald Reagan's was, Let, let's make America great again. And then in, in Trump's own Trumpian way, he turned that into the second person indicative, and he said, make America great again, we're going to do it, you know. Uh, but those are, those are two big differences. And so that logic prevailed on me in 2012. I was not initially a Trump supporter. I didn't like his campaign very much. I supported Ted Cruz. I did a TV commercial for Ted Cruz. Uh, I, I thought he would be a better candidate. Uh, I thought there were uh, decent arguments against Donald Trump. But ultimately, there was a choice. Donald J. Trump or Hillary Clinton and all her evil works and all her empty promises. That was the choice. Those were the choices before us. And uh, there was a third choice, which was ch chosen by the so-called Never Trumpers. And that uh, third choice was to throw up our hands and say, I, I just can't stomach it. I don't want to do it. You can't make me vote for either of these people. The Never Trump movement made one good argument, I felt. They made a lot of different arguments, but I felt one of them was actually sort of compelling, which is that Donald Trump was secretly a Democrat. And there was pretty good evidence for this. He uh, is a New Yorker. Uh, he's donated to a lot of Democrats. He's ostensibly voted for Democrats before. And when he flirted with running for the Reform Party nomination in 2000, he said very Democrat things. He said he's very, very pro-choice. You know, there are a lot of uh, warning signs here. So the Never Trump argument was that not only is he a Democrat, if he gets elected, he's going to govern like a Democrat. And that won't just be bad. It will be disastrous because it will hollow out the Republican Party and make it a vessel of leftism. We'll be much worse off even than we would be under Hillary Clinton. Uh, this I didn't think was terribly convincing. Because even if Donald Trump governed as a Democrat, he, he just couldn't be as bad as Hillary. Hillary Clinton is singularly awful. She is just You know, by the way, she's my fourth cousin, uh, twice removed, I believe. I, there is a relation that I have to Hillary Clinton, and it pains me to say this about my family, but she's really singularly awful. Uh, she uh, lies effortlessly, uh, using her husband's sex scandals is the best, probably the clearest example of this. She lied effortlessly for her husband in the 1990s. She smeared his victims. She was put in charge of the so-called bimbo eruptions. Uh, she uh, said that this, every scandal that the Clintons were involved in was a vast right-wing conspiracy. Lied, lied, lied. And she's wanted to move the US to the far left since her days of writing love letters to Saul Alinsky. Love letters which you can read, you know. Uh, this was a character argument against Hillary and against throwing my hands up in the air. Uh, another argument is that she is totally incompetent. Everything the woman touches turns to ash. She has had a terrible career in public service. Uh, Hillary Care in the 1990s was the first time we met her. She was put in charge of her husband's health care reform, and it utterly failed. It didn't go anywhere. Then uh, she was Secretary of State, and uh, one of her first acts as Secretary of State was to create a reset to uh, reset Russian relations between the United States and Russia in a rebuke to the Bush administration. So what does she do? She does this big press conference. She gets a button, you know, like one of those buttons they have at Staples, and it's supposed to say reset. And one word, one word in Russian. And she misspelled the word. So her, so her counterpart, her Russian counterpart, seized on this, pointed out that she couldn't even spell one word right, humiliated her and uh, by association in the United States on, during this international press conference. Very frustrating. She advocated a basically disastrous intervention into Libya in 2011. This led almost directly to her incompetence during the Benghazi consulate attack uh, later that year. Uh, the Benghazi, or pardon me, in uh, 20, 2012. Uh, this was the first time an ambassador had been killed since 1979, since another uh, failed Democrat administration. Uh, and, and what was so, I mean, it was an awful incident all around. What made it even worse is that she covered it up. 
She covered it up as quickly as she could. She said, oh, this was because of a spontaneous uprising to a YouTube video. The administration allowed this line to persist, even though we know from some of her emails that we've seen that she admitted uh, almost immediately that this was a terrorist attack in private emails. Uh, we didn't get to read all of those emails, of course, because she bleached her email server to cover up her own cover-up. She destroyed federal records. So that's the incompetence. She's just a terrible candidate. And she's a bad candidate because she hates her fellow countrymen. And she thinks they're deplorable. And she thinks they're irredeemable. We haven't even gotten to the policy argument against Hillary Clinton yet. We haven't even gotten to the policy argument of why to vote for Donald Trump. I'll just go down the list. I went to her campaign website, is still archived, by the way, and some of those are hilarious. If you have a few moments, I recommend <laughs> looking through it. Uh, just, just a few things. What did she want to do? Just write down the list. Raise taxes, waste money, gut the First Amendment, gut due process for college students. Uh, she wanted to derail the United States economy at the altar of global warning, warming for dubious uh, environmental gains. She wanted to let some criminals out of jail, got the Second Amendment, entrench Obamacare, and force Americans to purchase a product from a private company. She wanted to subsidize bad housing loans. She wanted to grant amnesty to illegal aliens. She wanted to expand the already gigantic bloated bureaucracy, kickbacks to teachers unions. She wanted to gut religious liberty. She wanted to uh, subsidize more, even more college debt and the college tuition bubble. She wanted to have a little race hustling mixed in there. She wanted to expand welfare and entitlements. She wanted to oppose the ability to protect our own elections by presenting an identification card. She wanted a little bit more financial regulation and taxpayer subsidized abortion. <sighs> That's, that, was, that was just her policy page on the website, just reading from her own campaign. In the face of that, the argument not to vote for either candidate uh, fell flat. It, to, to abdicate one's hard-won responsibilities and rights to vote fell totally flat. And I think this is a tendency of conservatives in particular. Uh, conservatives in, in particular uh, have this temptation toward rationalism, a little temptation toward ideology. Michael Oakeshott writes about this, the, the British political philosopher in Rationalism and Politics. He says that the rationalist is one who is, he's always standing for something. And you heard this from some of Trump's critics on the right during the campaign. Well, I stand for liberty, so I can't vote for Trump. I stand for equality, so I can't. I stand, I'm standing. They're always standing, and they're never doing anything. They're never moving or walking. or doing, They're just standing, as though, as though there were, it required courage to stand, or, you know, or to, uh, bravery to stand. Uh, the conservative is one who always prefers the practical to the theoretical. Some of the Trump critics on the right, some of the conservative Trump critics, even today, you can say, hey, you know, look at all this good stuff that Trump got us. Look at how good he's been. And they'll say, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I get that Trump works in practice. But does he work in theory? Does he work? It? Come on, man. Is he an intellectual? Uh, so you could, <laughs> I, someone in the audience said no. <laughs> we'll get to that a bit later, too, uh, because I think there's quite, quite a lot of evidence that he is rather smart. Uh, so you could risk that Donald J. Trump was going to govern half as a Democrat, uh, but he couldn't, be, he couldn't be worse than Hillary Clinton. All of the other conservative arguments against Donald Trump basically boiled down to his lack of couthness. He wasn't very couth, you know. He didn't hold his Chardonnay glass by the stem. He would hold it by the bowl, and it would, you know, the Chablis would get very warm, and this was just totally unacceptable. And he, he talked rough. He still talks rough. And this didn't bother me terribly much. I don't like it. I like when people speak politely and in a civilized way. But, I, you know, I'm from New York. People talk that way. It doesn't shock me. I don't clutch my pearls or anything like that. Uh, Donald Trump also uh, said unchivalrous things about women, to put it in a mild and <laughs> diplomatic way. Uh, he, he did do that, and that, that did bother me. But then again, uh, Hillary Clinton slandered the victims of her rapist husband. So, hmm, I, you know, Donald Trump says some mean things about women. Uh, Bill Clinton uh, turns them into human humidors in the Oval Office, and Democrats wanted to put that man back in the White House, and his enabler there as well. Probably not a good idea. Uh, and there were times when Donald Trump seemed less than knowledgeable about certain matters of public policy and foreign policy, and that's true. I grant that entirely. 
But Hillary Clinton, in her roles in public office and in foreign policy and in domestic policy, bungled up everything terribly. She was an utter failure in office. So that, I, if Donald Trump, if, he, if he's not as knowledgeable as Hillary Clinton, that's fine by me. <laughs> that knowledge hasn't served her terribly well. So I voted for Donald Trump. That was my decision. And I'm very glad that I did. I'm very glad that I voted for Donald Trump. I was very hesitant. I was so nervous. I was shaking as I was wearing my little, you know, American flag shorts to the polling booth. I said, I don't know, can I really do this? And I did, and it felt great. Because the policy victories immediately started to roll in. I, I did think he would govern half as a Democrat. I was so pleasantly surprised. On, on election night, everybody was surprised when he won. Uh, you know, uh, certainly Hillary Clinton was surprised when he won. I don't know if you were watching the victory party in Brooklyn, you know, and so <laughs> Hillary Clinton, uh, she didn't show up. You know, Hillary Clinton, the phone will ring at three in the morning and I'll show up, except I won't, except when it matters. You know, she was probably throwing la desk lamps or something in her hotel suite and she didn't show up. Instead, her campaign manager and sorcery cooking aficionado, John Podesta, showed up and he walked on stage and he said, thank you all for being here, thank you. And Hillary thanks you, you know, you're here for her and Hillary, she's always been here for you except right now, the only time that it matters, when she is nowhere to be found. So I, I felt pretty good about that. And then Donald Trump became president. The transition went in, he started to appoint people, and public policy started to roll out. Immediately, my fears subsided. I learned to stop worrying and love the dawn. It, it worked out very, very uh, well. That takes care of 2016. This brings us to 2020, the reasons to vote for Trump in 2020. Donald Trump has governed in a more conservative way than basically any president in modern history, totally unexpectedly. The Heritage Foundation admits this. The Heritage Foundation says that Donald Trump is enacting their conservative agenda at a faster rate even than Ronald Reagan. Now you might say Reagan had a Democrat Congress. Donald Trump apparently has everybody against him, every, a lot of collusion you know, to take out Donald Trump. Uh, but we got a wonderful Supreme Court justice. Uh, everyone on both sides of the aisle said there's no way he'll appoint an originalist to the Supreme Court. He appointed like Scalia Jr., you know, a thinner Scalia, more petite Scalia, but, a very, <laughs> but the brain was still there. Uh, we got massive deregulation, particularly at the EPA. We got a major tax reform bill, that, which was no easy feat. Uh, we got a decent foreign policy. We got a foreign policy that was robust, that put American strength first, not to be bellicose, not to start wars unnecessarily, but because peace comes through strength and chaos and war comes through weakness. And Donald Trump knew this. We've had the renegotiation of trade deals, which uh, some of the free traders uh, worry about, but let's not forget, we've had to rein in some bad actors. China is violating World Trade Organization treaties. They're stealing our intellectual property. They're illegally subsidizing the steel and aluminum industries. And we have to take a stand against that. The, even the property theft alone would, would say, we need to take a stronger stand. Republican candidates have been talking about this for years. Uh, Donald Trump finally did something about it. Uh, on Obamacare, the Republicans failed to repeal Obamacare. They've been talking about it since the minute Barack Obama was elected, and then they had the opportunity, they, they couldn't do it. But even in that case, Donald Trump managed to sneak in repeal of the funding mechanism of Obamacare, the individual mandate. He just snuck it into tax reform, which accelerated that death spiral tremendously, and it put it uh, on, a, on a collision course. So uh, even in that failure, uh, it turned out not so bad. He also pulled us out of the absurd Paris Climate Accord, the Paris Climate Accord that really wouldn't have done much one way or the other, uh, but uh, which in, it was mostly virtue signaling for totally dubious, totally unproven environmental and economic benefits, and he hasn't granted amnesty to uh, illegal aliens yet, which would, as uh, Democrat strategists have written publicly in memoranda, would uh, be a path to electoral dominance for Democrats. He still hasn't done that. That's a pretty good first year. That's, not, that's a good argument for uh, 2020. How about the temperament? The hysterical left, the more, more hysterical than usual left, has been telling us that Donald Trump's temperament is going to send us careening into World War III and into nuclear holocaust, and he's, you know, he's got the button and it's all gonna go crazy. And what have we seen this week? <laughs> that after 70 years of war and uh, possible nuclear strikes, 
Donald J. Trump may bring peace to the Korean Peninsula. I did not think that I would ever utter that statement, but that apparently is the case. Uh, bo uh, both sides are going to the uh, negotiating table. They've taken away the precondition that America must pull its troops out of Korea. He's actually doing a pretty good job on that front at maintaining the world order. He's done a good job at uh, punishing people who violate international norms and the policy of the United States and the international community. He's done that in Syria now. Uh, it's all in all pretty good. Uh, it, it turns out, this is where I'd like to address the idea that Donald Trump is an idiot, because that's, that's the meme. Uh, this, they did this to Bush, too. They did the same thing to George W. Bush. And you saw it uh, one time Christopher Hitchens uh, talked to Bill Maher about this. And you know, Bill Maher made some joke about how Bush was an idiot. And he said, you know, that's the joke that stupid people laugh at. That's the joke. Anybody can make that joke. It's so easy to make. I, I will posit for you that a guy who has had perhaps the most successful first year of any president, of either party actually, but certainly of a conservative president recently, a guy who's reached the absolute pinnacle of some of the most uh, competitive industries in the world, uh, including New York real estate, Manhattan real estate, gambling, network television where he sat on top numero uno for 15 consecutive seasons, network TV, and the first time he ran for anything, was elected to the highest political office in the history of the world. Maybe that guy's not a total idiot, you know? Maybe he's not totally incompetent. He's either, he's uh, maybe smarter than the average schlub, or he is the single luckiest human being <laughs> in the history of the world. Either way, I would be happy to have that guy as my president. That's not, not too bad. Uh, another aspect of Donald Trump that I think irked some conservatives, but probably is to our ultimate benefit is his pragmatism. He doesn't appear to be terribly ideologically conservative. You know, he doesn't go to ISI lunches or the Heritage Foundation, you know, and discuss the inner workings of entitlement reform or anything like that. He's, he's quite pragmatic. Uh, and this, uh, this was very important on, on a touchy issue that Barack Obama totally invented, uh, which is the transgender bathroom controversy of the last five years, you know, the, the most important issue facing our country. We've got nuclear weapons in Korea. No, we've got to talk about the five people on planet Earth who are confused about their biological sex. B Barack Obama honed in on this issue. He dis he, I think he, of his last year, he must have spent 90% of the time talking about why we need to let men use the women's room and women use the men's room, and this was an issue of natural rights and human dignity or, or whatever. Uh, Donald Trump comes in there and he said, you know, a, a small number of people have been confused about their biological sex since uh, ever, since the dawn of time, and they've all gone to the bathroom fine, and this has never been an issue that I've worried about, and so let, just do that. Just keep that, that sounds fine. And it totally quashed that issue. Now, some of the social conservatives wanted to say, no, but you've got to rub it in their face about biology and identity. He said, no, this doesn't, this is not a thing, this is not an issue to worry about. Calm down, despite the constant negative press covfefe, keep calm and make America great again. This, this pragmatism is an important aspect. It can really quell cultural uh, battles. So this brings me to, I think, the most important reason to vote for Donald, beyond the, the salty, delicious leftist tears. The, the most, really, the most important reason to vote for Donald Trump in 2016 or 2020 is that it shows that America still has a little bit of life left in it. It still has a little vigor. It still has a little recklessness. It still has spirit and life and ethos to it. You know, the, the kind of soulless march, tiresome, unpleasant slog toward progress with a capital P and a little trademark afterward. It made it clear what had to happen. Hillary Clinton had to become president. No person other than Hillary Clinton, probably including her husband, wanted this woman to be in the White House. But that was progress we have to do. We're going to have eight years of Obama, then we're going to have eight years of Hillary Clinton, and then we're going to have eight years of, I don't know, Tim Kaine, the second woman president. And then we're going to have maybe, I don't know, maybe we'll have uh, a Bush. Maybe that you can throw a Bush in there somewhere for a little bit, but certainly never a Reagan. We're not getting any more Reagans, and certainly never Donald Trump. Ain't gonna happen. And uh, do you know what the American people said to all that? They, said, they had two words, and it wasn't happy birthday, and it wasn't Hillary Clinton. They said, no way, pal, because uh, a, a central question of this was 
PC, it was political correctness. How could you vote for him? It's so politically incorrect, he's so icky. It's just not done. He talks plainly. He usually means what he says, actually. You know, the GOP would always pay lip service to things like uh, not granting amnesty, for instance. And, uh, but then they'd go and try to craft all of these amnesty bills behind everyone's back. They'd say, look, we have to, we have to do, what are we gonna do? Not grant them amnesty, that's what you're gonna do. Don't grant them amnesty. No, what are we gonna do? We have to do, you just said you weren't gonna, and Donald Trump goes in and then he doesn't grant amnesty. And he's still trying to build that wall. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. But he, he actually appears to mean what he says. Uh, you know, if, if people start to get silly ideas in America, like, you know, we're not gonna just go along with that. We're not gonna just elect Clinton because you people on TV tell me to. Uh, the mainstream media unites to shut people down. The, the mainstream media, big corporations, big technology, they unite to shut people down. If you are not ideologically uniform, that is it. If you, if you do make it to Facebook or YouTube or Twitter, you know, because you can't get on the mainstream media, what will happen is they'll censor you or they'll ban you or sh they'll shadow ban you or they'll censor all of your videos on YouTube. Uh, or if you work for Google, they'll fire you, like it happened to James Damore. Or if you hold a political view that was the consensus political view even a few years earlier on the question of gay marriage, and then that political view becomes unfashionable, you will lose your company, as happened to Brandon Icke at Mozilla. Comply, comply, comply. That is what an oppressive, corrosive, awful, uh, censorious, intersectional culture of leftism tells us to do in 2018. And uh, Donald Trump said no. Donald Trump said, I'm not gonna do that. One, one of the moments that Donald Trump had with the media that actually started to win me over to him, that made me think, oh, maybe this guy knows what he's doing, is uh, Donald Trump used the term anchor baby. You know, people who come here and they have a baby and then they, the baby has American citizenship and you can bring the whole family. He used the term anchor baby and the, the reporter said, don't you know that that term is offensive? He said, how's that offensive? What's, what's it? Oh, don't, it is, it's so offensive. So Trump says, uh, well, what would you like me to say? He said, you know, you should call them future, dreaming, undocumented, flag-waving, dreaming, baby, tax, whatever, you know. And Trump cuts him off and says, yeah, I think I'm gonna keep using anchor baby. I, yeah, I, I think that's just fine. I think that works just fine. It was so beautiful. It, it so highlighted that the absurdity of that oppressive culture that none of us really believes, none of us really take seriously, but we all feel that we have to comply. He knocked that down. He's a cultural warrior. And for even people on the right, some self-styled, sophisticated conservatives, uh, they're offended by this. You know the type who, uh, they're Ivy League educated, they, you know, they wear bow ties on days that are not their wedding. They, they, they have opinions about pate and you know, you certainly know the difference between Chablis and Sauvignon Blanc. There's no question about that. You know, oh, listen, I'm describing myself too. I do all these sorts of, I have a very similar bow tie. But, but, more, but more importantly than all that, because that I can get behind and I have a lot of opinions about pate. But more than that, what these people want and what, what separates them is they just want to be thought of as intellectual and sophisticated by the self-appointed elites who have no business calling themselves elites at the New York Times. They just want to appear intellectual and sophisticated. That, you know, they write for the New York Times. They're, they're they, they say, I'm a Republican, but I'm not that kind of Republican. Please like me, like me, you know. I, that is what I call, I call them Republican, but not that kind of Republicans. That's there, they're so afraid. They're, they, they feel that they have much more in common with people at the New York Times or the Washington Post. And uh, their agenda basically is, we need to lower taxes and we need to reform entitlements and uh, deregulate a little bit, but not too much. And it's basically an agenda of bean counting. I'm not opposed to those things. I like those things a lot. I like lower taxes. I want to reform entitlements. I like all of those things. But they must be grounded in, in cultural questions. Uh, politics is downstream of culture, as Andrew Breitbart was fond of saying. Even questions like tax reform are ultimately cultural questions. What, what money is, how property relates to us in this society, how we view ourselves, and the unity of our lives and our relationship to our countrymen. These are, these are cultural battles and all real political battles are cultural battles. Cultural battle is the only way to crack a corrupt and divisive, awful leftism. That is not gonna be pretty, that is not going to be easy, 
Uh, it, it's going to involve people who use huge words and say you know, rough things a lot. Lord Acton said this very well. I'm going to say it poorly because I'm paraphrasing him, but he said it very well, which is that at all, time, uh, at all times, the friends of liberty have been few, and they've achieved what they have achieved by associating with auxiliaries whose goals often differ from their own. And this involves a lot of risk and a lot of moral risk because when those auxiliaries do bad things, uh, we uh, feel that we're a part of that. But it is the only way to accomplish any actual goal in politics because we live in the real world in time and space. Uh, if we want responsible government, we must behave like adults and, and make responsible choices. The, the left is going to throw everything they can at this guy, the, the Russia stuff, and uh, you know the disgruntled FBI director that all the Democrats used to say was the worst person ever born on Earth, and now they say he's like Saint James, Saint James Comey. Uh, you know they'll throw slander and libel and porn stars at him, and we need to rise above that and behave like adults, not like uh, children. We need to recognize that we have to win real victories in time and space. We have to take the victories that we can get when we can get them and say, oh, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to vote for Trump because maybe like in 20 years we'll get a conservative candidate that I like a little bit more and so I'll, we'll just wait. And You can't wait. You have to behave like an adult and make a, a morally responsible decision. Uh, we, we must, despite the constant negative press, kofefe. We need to ignore that negative press. We need to embrace that exuberance and that reality of, of uh, this moment. The left simply wants to destroy and deconstruct and divide and divide and divide and attack. And what we must do is build our culture and politics back up. We must build and we must make. We have to build on the victory of 2016. We have to build on it in 2018. We have to build on it in 2020. And we must make America great again and again and again and again and again. Thank you very much. You're up. Uh, we're going to advance to the Q&A, so I mean, you can stay right here okay. if you'd like. Great. And uh, I just needed to. You, you have very good PowerPoint skills. I know. I like these. <laughs> I know. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. Testing. There we go. All right, we're starting the Q&A. So raise your hands and I will come around to you. Perfect, first one. <laughs> I'm so glad to get a chance to speak to everyone here for the first time. Now, I, I, I'll seriously take two seconds, but I have to make sure that these questions are asked of you. They're the most important ones, and then I'll let uh, them all put you to the fire. All right. Do you really have a $400 bet with Ben that Trump would win in 2016? Oh, well, no, I had a $100 bet with Ben, and he gave me odds because he was so confident. And then when President Kofefe did make it across the finish line, I had to shake him down by his ankles, and I now have it framed on my set every single day. It's a beautiful thing. Fantastic. Continuing with the speed round, what is your Myers-Briggs personality type? I, did, I took one of these. I am an ENTJ, I think. I guessed it right. It's on the paper, and you'll, you'll see it in a really? second. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Look at this. Is that, no. That was right. No, hey, yeah, you got it. I think yeah. you're ENTJ. You nailed it. Now, what's awesome. my horoscope sign? What's my rise? You know, Mercury's in retrograde. What do you know? No, we'll talk about it later. Those don't exist. Um, was it scary hosting Jordan B. Peterson on your show, and did you clean your room afterwards? I never clean my room, though I do like Jordan very much. Uh, what was difficult with Jordan is... It's very difficult to get Jordan to laugh, and I have made it a mission in life to make Jordan Peterson laugh. And I, I got like half of a chuckle once, which I took as a great victory, but that can be a little intimidating. You're trying to tell jokes, and he's just like, you know. He is Clean your room, Michael, I know you haven't. Be like a lobster. Yeah. You often mention your lovely little Elisa on yes. your podcast. How do you annoy her most, and how do you make up for it? 
Uh, well, I think that probably contributes to annoying her most, you know, constantly referring to sweet little Elise on the podcast. She's not a big fan of the cigars, and I smoke about 150,000 cigars per day. Uh, but, you know, sweet little Elisa is like a true saint and a martyr, and she's taken it upon herself to try to make me live, you know, for a little bit longer in this world, pull me out of the gutter, you know, just there slobbering to myself in booze and stogies. And uh, so I think she takes that suffering as a sanctifying experience. And finally, what color is Kofefe? Oh, that's an excellent question, but if you don't know, I couldn't possibly tell you. Sorry. I was hoping you would reveal yourself. That's all right. <laughs> Next question. Thank, oh, thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier Bill Clinton, and you mentioned that Bill Clinton was a rapist, and... He still I think is. I, I'm not saying he's not, um, and I think that you drew an equivalence between Bill Clinton and Donald Trump. Have you considered maybe they are both very bad? Well, I, I, I certainly compared the two men. Uh, I, I I've spoken to one of Bill Clinton's victims. I've spoken to Juanita Broderick at length, and I believe her. I do. Uh, this is not to say there can be plenty of false accusations. People do it all the time. Uh, there have been many of these instances on college campuses in the last five years. But I believe Juanita Broderick, and I've seen a lot of uh, scandals and made ginned up scandals around Donald Trump. Does Donald Trump uh, have an unchivalrous way with women? I don't think anyone on planet Earth would disagree with that. But I haven't seen, uh, I haven't seen accusations the, with the seriousness and persistence of those accusations against Bill Clinton and the ways in which he did it and the places in which he did it and the abuses of power that were involved in his doing it and the abuses of the public trust uh, that were entailed in Bill Clinton's exploits. I haven't seen any of that with Donald Trump. That's not to say that Donald Trump is a monk or a saint or you know even a, a well-behaved guy when it comes to those sorts of things, but I, I don't think they're on the same level. I, I don't see evidence of that. If someone presented me evidence with that, I would, I would consider it. Hi. Oh. Um, so given the success that Trump has had on social media in, in the, the 2016 campaign and now with all the scrutiny on these platforms, how do you see the online landscape changing in terms of the 2018 and even 2020 campaigns? They're, they're trying to shut us down. That is what is happening. The mainstream media were able to shut conservatives out for 70 years. They were able to kick us off of television, boot us out of Hollywood studios, and finally the internet happened and we killed it, man. The conservatives are so much better at the internet. We're bigger, faster, funnier. It is all the good memes are conservatives. The blank book thing happened because conservatives are very clever online. It's not me. I told a very simple joke. And then all of these conservatives started leaving 10 paragraph reviews citing Sophocles and Thucydides, and it's very, very funny. The wit is all there. And conservatives have used social media very effectively since the beginning. Donald Trump used it much better than Hillary Clinton did. By the way, when Barack Obama was uh, perhaps misusing data on Facebook, at a, at a much a higher rate, by the way, than this mostly made up Cambridge Analytica scandal. When Barack Obama was stealing the data or using the data without consent of 190 million Americans compared to, at high estimates, 70 to 80 million Americans, as happened with Cambridge Analytica for a variety of other candidates. When Obama did that, the mainstream media said, he's the digital candidate. He's the candidate of youth. Good for him. What a genius. And the Obama campaign, by the way, admitted, they came out, they said, using data from Facebook without people's consent was a game changer. It was the most important technology we used in that campaign. And the media, they celebrated it. Then Donald Trump gets good at social media, and it is a crime with testimony and investigations and wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's absurd, and they're, they're out for blood. This is why they're dragging Mark Zuckerberg over this complete non-troversy, this ridiculous made-up scandal. They're dragging him here because conservatives used it to win. They're going to keep trying to censor us. They censor many of my videos, if not most of them, on YouTube because I'm such an intimidating guy, as you can tell. They uh, shadow ban conservatives. We, we've seen that on tape. They've admitted to it. And they're going to keep doing it. And then we're going to have to find another venue because their first instinct is to censor. And ours is to let freedom reign because that we know in a free exchange of ideas we're going to win. Thanks. Uh, 
Uh, hey, Michael, love your show. Um, Thanks. Uh, what's the risk of uh, Trump being primaried by, say, like a, a Flake or a Corker in 2020? Well, are Flake and Corker going to run in the Democrat primary or are they going to run in the Republican primary? All, they, all I ever see from those guys is them complaining about and criticizing Republicans. With Republicans like them, who needs Democrats? I don't think they pose any threat whatsoever. If there were a serious politician, a respectable conviction candidate, somebody like Ted Cruz, for example, to primary Donald Trump, I think you'd have some trouble there. Because, he, because you have a conviction, you have something you believe. But if it's just whiny little opportunists who are upset that the president was mean to them and they might not win re-election, I don't think they'll pose any threat at all. Hi, Michael. In your lecture, you mentioned uh, Trump's non-interventionist foreign policy promises. Last week, we saw the Syria strike. Do you see that as Trump reneging on his promises? And what do you think the implications of that strike are uh, like just for foreign policy in general? I, I don't think it's reneging on his promises because I don't think he promised non-intervention or isolation. Conservatives, we want to be so extreme. We want it one way or the other. We either want to bomb every country on earth or we want to you know, re retreat into our bunkers and eat meals ready to eat and just keep our guns by our pillows or something. And I think Donald Trump being pragmatic and being a pragmatist says we are going to intervene in some cases when uh, the costs are relatively low and the benefits are relatively better, you know, the art of the deal when it involves shooting missiles into Syria. And, uh, and in other cases, we're not going to do that and we're going to try to have strategic uh, goals. So with uh, Barack Obama, he invented red lines out of whole cloth. And then what was so awful about that, regardless of what you think about intervening in the Syrian civil war, is that he refused to back up his words. So the credibility of the United States looked like it was worthless. And here, fortunately, with Donald Trump, we have him uh, backing up American credibility abroad, but without a terrible cost. So we say these weapons are prohibited. They violate international norms. They violate the policy of the United States. We're not going to permit that. It, it looks to me, if I had to guess, like a foreign policy of mowing the lawn. We don't have to go and invade every country on Earth, but when those weeds get a little high, you've got to mow them with some cruise missiles or something like that. That seems perfectly fine. People caricature Trump's national security advisor, John Bolton, a very brilliant man. Uh, they try to caricature him as someone who all he wants to do is bomb everyone else in the world. But uh, Ambassador Bolton has been fairly clear about Syria and said Syria is not the strategic central question uh, to the world order or in American foreign policy. There are other places and we need to balance the risks and rewards as they come. That's not a clear foreign policy. That isn't all one way or the other. But as Dr. Johnson pointed out, all shallows are clear. Uh, thank you uh, for your show. Awesome. Big fan. Thank you very much. Um, especially, it's a nice break from Ben's show. Uh, well, Ben, you know, he talks like 400 words a minute, so I have to, I, I, you, for other podcasts, I speed them up 2x, and for Ben, I slow it down. I slow it down, so 50%, yeah. 50%, yeah. Yeah, and I find I get a little angry. Like, I love Ben, he's an awesome guy, but, like, he's just so serious. So, like, watching a show where you laugh and Clavin show, too, uh, is a nice change. <laughs> you got to listen to Ben's first, because you'll get, like, all the news, and you'll just think, like, this world is about to explode, <laughs> man. I, you know, then, then hopefully it gets a little lighter in Covfefe. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for my question, so uh, I saw Andrew uh, Andrew's talk at um, at UT uh, Austin, and he talked a lot about the culture and talked a lot about how uh, there were a lot of questions about how you know conservatives can kind of infiltrate the culture and the media and you know create art um, that 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 changes society that changes the, the, the culture. And I think over these past you know ten years, there's been a radical change. And you know now you have people like Crowder, you have CRTV, you have the Daily Wire. Um, where people are just creating a lot of great content. So, you know, moving ahead, where do you, you know, and, you know, uh, someone who has a background in theater, uh, where do you see those big cultural changes uh, on the right, um, you know, happening in terms, of, uh, in terms of art, in terms of media, in terms of, um, yeah, I guess just, I guess just, Changing, I don't know if that... that changing, changing the culture and changing it to affect politics. It's very heartening because as a conservative who's, you know, I've been in lots of like 
I, I won't even call them C-list films. I'll call them like H-list films, you know, that air on channel 3000 at 2 in the morning or something. But as a result of that, I've been around a lot of conservatives in show business in New York and Hollywood and we're a, a, you know, a much beleaguered group, not just because it's difficult and conservatives get blacklisted from the major studios and the major programs and the major uh, publishing institutions, but because conservatives themselves don't want to consume the culture. Uh, Drew points this out a lot, that conservatives are often Philistines and they don't want to read novels and they don't want to listen to audio books and they don't want to go see the movies. So one aspect of hope, you bring up Crowder, you bring up all of these podcasts, uh, these guys are breaking through. Crowder would never be hired by Saturday Night Live, right? Crowder wouldn't, they wouldn't put him on The Daily Show, even though he's way funnier than any of those guys. You know, but they wouldn't, they refuse to do that because the left gets so complacent. It's the same thing as being a conservative in a left-wing culture on campus. It, it makes you much smarter. It makes you uh, have better arguments because you constantly have to defend what you think and refine what you think because maybe uh, the 97 percent of lefties around you on campus or in Hollywood or in New York, they'll point some of, out a flaw in your argument and then you'll have a stronger argument. You'll find out what you really believe. They never have that opportunity. So what the left is doing is they're using all the old technology. They're fighting the last war. They, they got so complacent that they, you know, they make big movies and that don't make any money, of course, but they still make them somehow, and TV, and that, but publishing, and blah, blah, blah. But conservatives, we've been forced to innovate. So we're much sharper on the internet. We're, we're making shows and programs for shoestring budgets. Uh, my own little plug is I did a narrative podcast with Andrew Clavin, which is, uh, he wrote a story called Another Kingdom, and I performed all of the roles, and I can attest that it was a shoestring budget, unfortunately. Very, very shoestring. But as a result, we were able to put out a very popular piece of conservative culture for relatively nothing. Those gatekeepers can't hold us back anymore, and it's, the, the place you will find it is where the gatekeepers haven't shown up yet, and our goal is we have to keep those gatekeepers away as long as we can. And then we'll move on to something else. Absolutely not. Yeah, you bet. Awesome. Um, so do you see that as more, you know, right now, obviously, there's a lot of subscription-based, you know, sites like The Blaze and CRTV and, and, you know, Daily Wire. Do you see it more as following in that subscription model? Do you think that there's going to be, you know, I hear people talk about a, pl a platform to rival YouTube uh, or something like that. You know, do you think it's going to consolidate? Do you, I, I mean... Do you have any thoughts on that? It would be hard for conservatives to make our own YouTube. I wish we would do it. I think it would be great because they wouldn't censor my videos where I talk to authors or whatever and they say, this is too dangerous. They wouldn't censor Dennis Prager explaining why you shouldn't murder people. Do not murder. That was censored by YouTube because Dennis Prager was explaining a commandment. Uh, so I, I would prefer that. I suspect it would, it would ghettoize us. I suspect... Uh, the people who are politically tuned in and really view things in a philosophical or ideological way, there aren't that many of us, and of conservatives, that were probably half of those people, and it, it would just probably not work. The reason that YouTube works is that everybody's on YouTube. The reason that Twitter works is that everybody's on Twitter, even though they keep kicking all of us off Twitter, but there's still a lot of people there. I suspect uh, that, unfortunately, won't happen. So I think what we have to do is be the subversive ones. We in the culture now, we on the right, are the subversive ones. The stodgy, old, decrepit, corrupt establishment is a left-wing establishment. We get to subvert, and I think we should subvert on their own platforms. And I think we should keep doing it and doing it until another one uh, pops up. And I don't think we should cede that field to them at all and try to ghettoize ourselves. We've got to crack it from within. Thank you. So what about the wall? You're telling me. You're telling me, man. I, it's been a little... I, you, you don't want the wall. You, you, you do want the... I want the wall, too. I know. We need to do the wall. There, it's, it's become very uh, frustrating because this seems like a simple enough matter, doesn't it? But uh, it's going to be held up forever. And that shows us two things. It shows us, one, how people on the right and Republicans usually don't really mean what they say. They say one thing. They say, we're going to repeal Obamacare, repeal Obamacare, repeal Obamacare. And then they say, okay, now you can do it. So, oh, uh, what, I, 
I didn't say I wanted to repeal Obamacare. I, you know, I thought, and we're seeing this a little bit on the wall too. What it also shows us is that the federal bureaucracy is far too large and has far too much power. I had the privilege of speaking with Justice Scalia twice before he died, and we asked him what the greatest threat to the republic is and threat to American liberty. He said it's the unaccountable bureaucracy that can hold up the, the wall construction because of you know, the spotted salamander that hops across the Rio Grande and that's why we can't protect our sovereign country and we can't enforce democratically enacted immigration laws. Uh, nevertheless, I, I think we're going to keep pushing here and one aspect of Donald Trump that I really took me a while to appreciate is that he makes these outrageous claims, or he pushes very, very far to, to push you beyond the sale. Scott Adams, the Dilbert guy, uh, brought my attention to this, that he'll say, you know, we're going to build the wall and Mexico's going to pay for it. And then all of a sudden, everyone's arguing about who's going to pay for the wall, but you've already accepted the premise that we're going to have a wall, right? That would have been unthinkable even a few years ago. So I, I am uh, holding out some hope uh, for the art of the deal. And maybe in my glass half full way, uh, Donald Trump is saving the wall so that we have to reelect him. Knock on wood. I'm, I'm uh, unfortunately skeptical. Uh, you know, t what, uh, trust but verify was Reagan's line. <laughs> and, uh, but, but hopefully it will happen eventually because it's important symbolically and it's important practically. Walls work. There are walls all around this building. There are walls in this, uh, in this classroom and we ought to have walls to protect our country as well. Uh, hello, thank you for coming here. Uh, I'm from former Soviet Union, as you can tell by my accent. And when I came here 20 years ago, it was a complete, complete shock to me that uh, leftist ideas are very popular here. And uh, left is basically poisoning kids in schools and colleges. And uh, uh, we, you mentioned Dennis Prager, and he saved me after Obama was elected second time. He was talking about five stages of grief, and it was exactly like was my experience. So anyway, my question is, uh, what is your opinion about conservative radio? And also, I would recommend all young people to listen to conservative radio. And who is your favorite talk show host? I, there are too many to count. Rush is the original one. But I, thank you so much for mentioning that, that you're, you're from the Soviet Union and you're horrified by the evils of leftism and of totalitarianism. Because I, I didn't live in the Soviet Union forever, but I, I did visit Cuba briefly over the summer. And the first thing I noticed there is that people don't wear Che Guevara t-shirts in Cuba. The Cubans don't wear them. White liberals wear them in the United States. White useful idiots in America wear Che Guevara t-shirts because they don't know the horrors of enslavement and property confiscation and physically being brutalized by the government. They don't know what that's like. Uh, they, they, uh, they would deny, I think, the reality of those things. What they wear in Cuba are American flags. I saw it a dozen times in just a few days, sewn onto jeans, on their little bicycles, on the few meager pieces of property that they're allowed to have without it being confiscated. It's so important. And this, this your, your point on conservative talk radio uh, gets back to uh, something that I brought up a little earlier. You know, I love Dennis Prager. Dennis is my cigar buddy. We're very fortunate to have him in Los Angeles. And sometimes the sophisticates, the academic types, they say, oh, how can you listen to conservative talk radio? They take complex ideas and boil them down and make them so simple. Dennis Prager is a very, very intelligent guy. And he has an amazing gift to boil down complex things and go piece by piece and make them uh, digestible to a mass audience. That is a wonderful thing. There should be no snobbishness here. There should be no uh, nose in the air, you know, trying to sip your Chablis or something like that. These are real problems, and I fear that people who grew up in privilege, ironically, it's all the people yelling at us about our privilege that are the ones that uh, have had privilege uh, destroy their minds and distort their vision. Uh, people who have grown up in privilege, they don't understand what, uh, how brutal the conclusion of leftist ideas can really be, and I hope that conservative talk radio helps, but I also hope that people like you who have seen it firsthand, who have experienced it, uh, can, can talk up and tell them what you've seen and explain uh, reality to, to these people. It's, it's a very important thing, and it's, a, it's an irony. 
uh, when they are like willing to listen. But some people said, oh, no, 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 it just happened there, it never happened here, and they don't understand that this is utopia which kills people, literally kills. It's not just making people poor, it's just socialism kills. It, it does, utopia kills, people think utopia means the best place, that's what they think the word means. It doesn't, it means no place. That's what the word, it means no place, it doesn't exist, it's a fantasy. In uh, Democrat politicians used to frequently quote a line from George Bernard Shaw. They would say, some people see things that are and ask why, but I dream things that never were and ask why not. And they say this as though it's some uplifting, inspirational quote. What they fail to mention, because they don't read beyond the, the quote book, is that it wasn't George Bernard Shaw who said that. It was George Bernard Shaw writing in the mouth of the serpent tempting Eve in the play Back to Methuselah. Those are the words of the devil, and uh, that, that utopian vision it leads to very, very dark places. We've seen it for so long, well over a century, and uh, un unfortunately, people seem to forget, and what is that they tell you? When you forget history and you don't learn from the past, you're doomed to repeat it, sadly. Hi, Michael. Um, uh, how much, um, how much would you estimate that the deep state has over the U.S. domestic and foreign policy right now, given the raid on Trump's office in his personal term? So, to to use the term, because I I think a lot of conservatives they they think that we're talking about some crazy conspiracy thing when we use the term the deep state. All the deep state means is the entrenched bureaucracy that has no democratic accountability. We the people have not put them there. They're the lifers in DC who construct an inordinate amount of our public policy and really have an inordinate impact on our political lives and the way that we're governed. Uh, the deep state or the federal bureaucracy has grown so enormously, you don't even need to see Intelligence agencies, the and the intel and the intelligence agencies are, are a part of that. You know, it's funny because people have these images of like all of the all of government is just this awful bureau where people like aren't that efficient and they always bungle things. But then they have this image of the CIA or something as this amazingly effective organ. You know, and they're like Jack Bauer, or whatever. You know, and look, these are wonderful organizations that can keep us safe. But it is the government. We are talking about the government here. It has a, a hugely outsized role of public policy. I don't think that you need to look at the raid on Michael. Cohen's a lawyer to see that, though certainly that could uh, alert one to, to a problem. I think what you have to see is uh, agencies invalidating Trump federal policies. I think you need to see agencies saying, no, no, sorry, uh, people of America, sorry, duly elected representatives, we're the benevolent betters and we're going to tell you how to run your lives better than you can. That to me throws up warning flags. Perhaps thing, you know, when the agencies are coming after the duly elected president, when Bill Kristol, a leader for a long time of the conservative movement says between the Trump state, that is the elected sovereign state, and the deep state or the bureaucracy, I choose the deep state. When you have people saying that, that is a terrifying place in, in the country. And so perhaps that calls our attention to it. But uh, I, I'm, I am grateful for those raids if it can call people's attention to how we have to shrink that headless, godless, unaccountable bureaucracy. You estimate like a percentage? Oh, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to quantify that, right? I mean, one, one special counsel investigation is, uh, is worth quite a lot, isn't it? In a broader sense of the country as a whole, like over the past like 20 years, I think it's been growing for about a century. I think uh, the administrative state has ballooned and ballooned. I'm sorry to say that it was Republicans who invented the income tax and the IRS. It happened with Abraham Lincoln and it happened with uh, William Howard Taft. And, uh, but agencies have ballooned and ballooned and ballooned and they can ruin you. They can uh, forget even uh, Donald Trump or the intelligence agencies or, or the, the things that kind of make splashy headlines on the internet. They can just ruin you. Dinesh D'Souza donated a little bit too much money to a state candidate, to a candidate for Senate in New York, who by the way was never going to win. I was working elections at the time of that race. It was just a nice thing for a friend. And Barack Obama selectively prosecuted him. The uh, federal agencies went in there and destroyed this guy's life. You saw the IRS targeting conservatives uh, during the Tea Party movement. You saw them targeting groups that I, I am a member of they were targeting. Uh, that, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry that I can't give you a, an exact number, 
because you, you, one of these incidents could be far worse than 99% of them. But the, the simple answer is it's too much and, it's, and it has grown and crept over a century in an insidious way. And that's why it's going to take more than one man named Donald Trump to, to crack that or other conservative activists. We have to be relentless in wresting our power back from the government. Good question. Hi. Thank you again so much for coming out. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit. I'm from Michigan, and so obviously I'm very worried about my friend Tim Allen. Uh, I'm sure you know his show was canceled a couple seasons ago yeah. uh, after six uh, after six seasons. Uh, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about what your thoughts are on the future of not necessarily conservative voice, but conservative storylines being told in Hollywood and on uh, network television. I know there's, there's a currently a lot of back and forth going, about, going on about Roseanne, but I think Tim Allen kind of fell by the wayside. You know, he had six seasons, and uh, his show was about in the top third of brackets about network at the time, and it was kind of unexpectedly canceled. Mm -hmm. Just kind of your thoughts on that, what you knew about it at the time. They, they don't learn anything. What I can tell you just from my uh, brief time in Hollywood is I don't think it's uh, like someone sitting at his chair petting his cat, you know, thinking, ah, ha, 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 how can I ruin Tim Allen's life today? They, they're just a little dim. I, I think they, they say, okay, we're going to, whenever they make conservative art, it always is great. In fact, when they make non-leftist art, it always does really, really well, and people really, really like it. Uh, Roseanne is a good example of this. Roseanne is not a conservative. <laughs> Roseanne, you know, doesn't, doesn't go to the Heritage Foundation or anything like that, but it was a non-leftist show. It's a show that shows America as it is with all of its warts, and she says, nah, I'm voting for Trump. Yeah, I really like him, and it's, it's done very well, it, and uh, they, even controlling for nostalgia TV or whatever, it's blown past anything else, but they keep doubling down because they're in such a little cocoon themselves. They don't know anyone who voted for Donald Trump. They don't know anyone. They don't know anyone who watches Tim Allen's show. Tim Allen's show is very, very popular. They don't know anyone who does it. it, it it's so uh, isolated for them, and I, I, I pity them for it. I really do. I pity us a little bit, too, because it ruins our culture. But I pity them, because we can see it when a conservative is so uh, beleaguered by the culture constantly, the popular culture, it becomes a little clearer. Uh, what works, what doesn't work, what people want, what they don't want. But when all you do, look, Los Angeles is a driving city. On average, you see three people there a day. <laughs> you know, you get in your car, uh, and then you drive to your network, and then you talk to all lefties all day long, and that's all you do. Then maybe you drive to a cocktail party, and you see exactly the same people, all of whom donated to Hillary Clinton, none of whom have ever watched Tim Allen's show, and then you drive home again, and you rinse and repeat. You just keep doing that on and on and on. Uh, I wish there were some way to show them. Uh, I thought that the high ratings for conservative art would do this. Good war movies, you know, that show America in a good light, or television shows that break that narrative. But uh, they seem not to get the message. They, they keep uh, asking Jimmy Kimmel to host the Oscars. This year, the Oscars were down 20% over a nine-year low. They'll probably have them do it again next year. Jimmy Kimmel gave a joke-free monologue this year. There were no jokes. It was just political diatribes, but that's what they've all convinced themselves uh, sells, because it sells with their friends. Trouble for them is it doesn't sell for the American people, and thankfully we have other venues now that might not be network television, but we can get the, the word out and uh, we can get our, e even our art out as well. Hi, Michael. Thanks a lot for coming. Um, some of the president's biggest supporters, maybe we'll call them always Trumpers, uh, seem to have this, uh, they subscribe to this notion of four-dimensional chess, that, uh, you know, this idea that he's five steps ahead of everyone, and when he appears to be shooting himself in the foot politically, it's actually part of his brilliant master plan. Um, now, I think on your show, you've said that you don't subscribe to this idea. But I, I think it's totally made up. I think it's a fiction invented by Never Trumpers. Uh, and I'll uh, clarify that. I don't think that Donald Trump is playing 17-dimensional chess, and I don't know anybody who thinks that Donald Trump is playing 17-dimensional chess, and I know a lot of Donald Trump supporters. What we all think is this guy is pretty good at the media. 
That's what we think. That is our grand suggestion. There is one group that says he's a total dolt and an idiot and just happens to be lucky all the time, every single stage of his life, every minute of the day. And then there's another group that says he's really, really good at the media, much better, not only than other politicians, but better than the reporters and the journalists and the TV comedians and all of them. That, I think, is a perfectly obvious uh, observation. And rather than uh, always Trumpers, uh, conservative supporters of the president, denying his stupidity, I think what's really happening is uh, that the Never Trump movement made a difficult calculation and they made the wrong calculation. And they're, they're trying to justify it by pretending that he's adult when it's obvious that he isn't. Hi, how are you? Um, so I think you've made a very clear point that um, Unfortunately, conservative opinions are being restricted, limited, shut down, however you want to say it, in universities, Hollywood, YouTube, Twitter. So I guess a question I'd have for you, as a, as a frustrated conservative, where, where did conservatives go wrong? How, how come the gatekeepers are all liberal? Like, is that a question you ask yourself? Like, or do you just assume that you know, in Hollywood there's going to be this liberal bias? YouTube has a liberal bias. Like, why is that a thing? Clearly, the content that conservative culture puts out is like really good content. So wh why is it always that the gatekeepers have this liberal bias? It's because we didn't play 16D chess and, and they did, to, to borrow from the last question. It's because we seeded the campuses to the left. It's because we seeded Hollywood to the left. We, we gave it up. We allowed them to take over. And so the radicals of the 1960s have become the tenured radicals and the professors of uh, our own era. We gave it up. And in part, this is because artists tend to be on the left. This is uh, true throughout history. And as an occasional artist myself, I'll explain it. It's because artists are completely out of their minds. They are unmoored. They are allergic to getting a paycheck. They cannot wake up before 2 PM. You know, the song from Pinocchio is right. Hi, diddle dee dee, the actor life for me. You just kind of walk through life and do 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 do, you know, and there is no responsibility in, in one uh, doesn't do conventional things. And so this uh, appeals to lefties <laughs> in a way that conservatives think like, huh, wait, I can go to Wall Street and then make all of the money? Well, maybe I'll do that. Maybe that sounds a little bit better than, you know, doing some black box play on some godforsaken boulevard in Los Angeles. So uh, that, I think there's a temptation in the culture to move to the left. I think uh, also the academy, by virtue of living a purely intellectual life, a life that uh, does not have much practical application, also attracts the left. Because as I mentioned earlier in the remarks, conservatives tend to prefer the practical to the purely theoretical. We don't say, who cares if it works in practice? Does it work in theory? You know, we, we live in time and space. We have uh, bodies. We have a soul. We have a body. And we're a unified uh, person. So uh, I think both of those things tend to attract the left. And that creates culture. The intellectuals uh, on campuses who educate the next generations create the culture. And uh, in Hollywood, they create the popular culture. And that's exported around the world. There are excellent conservative artists. I know many of them, but there, there aren't that many of them. And so it's easy to sort of gang up on them, especially after a series of legal d decisions during the 20th century in Hollywood that basically destroyed the studio system, took a serious businessmen out of the equation, and gave the asylum to the lunatics to run free with. The same thing has happened on college campuses. At this point, the uh, I'll use my own dear old Yale as an example here. Yale has led the way in campus insanity over the last three years. They have been the, uh, they've had shrieking girl yelling at professors and saying, this isn't about an intellectual space. This is about my comfort and my home. And uh, what does the administration do? They say, oh, I'm sorry. OK, whatever you want. You, OK, that's fine, darling. It's the same thing that, uh, that happened in Hollywood. We've let the lunatics run the asylum. And I think the, the, the only way to, uh, grab that back, is to find those conservative intellectuals, to find those conservative artists, and using the tools that are now available to us, that are now at our disposal, that did not exist 20 years ago, blast them out to everybody and hope that conservatives aren't such Philistines that they won't watch cultural products. Hi. 
go to an all-girls school in New Jersey. I'm a junior in high school. Um, it's, a, it's an extremely re liberal school, and I have friends who openly talk about how they would never talk or associate themselves with people who vote for Trump. So I was wondering how you would suggest I get my opinion out there uh, and have a conversation in that kind of environment. Yeah, it's a difficult, especially in high school. High school is not known for being the most reasonable place on earth, you know. It's a little clicky and a little catty, and so you might be out of luck, unfortunately, for the, the near future. But you bring up a great point, which is that they'll say, I don't know anyone who voted for Trump. I won't talk to anyone who voted for Trump. I'm going to unfriend you on Facebook if you voted for Trump. And there are studies about this. Leftists unfriend conservatives and block conservatives on social media three times as much as conservatives do that to lefties. Jonathan Haidt uh, studied this a few years ago, and it was even reported in the New York Times, which is that conservatives understand the left-wing point of view. Conservatives understand lefties, but lefties don't understand conservatives, because conservatives view the world uh, in, in different categories, in, in more categories, uh, whereas the left has a more narrow view of the world. So y what I would recommend to you, a high school junior, uh, w surrounded by all of these other high school juniors, is you've got to treat those little children like children. You have to be the adult, and you have to treat them like children. I don't mean that you have to smack them around and like punch them in the face. That is not what good parents generally do. They don't like torture their kids, but they have to be a little firm. They have to be loving. They don't love their countrymen on the left. They think they're deplorable and irredeemable. But we should love our country. I do love my countrymen, and I want them to do better and see the world better and have a better life. Because they look miserable all the time, don't they? They're shrieking and they're shouting and they wear those ridiculous hats and they yell profanities all the time. And when Donald Trump was elected, that woman in the video that was going around said, no, you know, it was so delicious. I'm sorry, I'm getting very, getting distracted here. Uh, we, have to, we have to do that. You, you need patience, you need a saintly patience, and you have to not be afraid. Unfortunately, when you have an environment that toxic, when you have a leftist culture that toxic, where and that cultish, by the way, where they say, we won't associate unless you're in our group, we won't talk to you, that means you're gonna lose friends. And that's sad, that's a really sad thing. But you, the truth above all things, and I, and. It's, you know, you're attending lectures at the University of Pennsylvania as a junior in high school, so you're probably fairly mature yourself, and I bet you can handle it. Um, so you, I'm glad you mentioned height, um, because I think, uh, you know, his stuff is really, and uh, if I may just add to, you know, what you mentioned, um, specifically his research is like the, the people on the left and the right view um, the world in different categories in a moral regard, right? Right, um, values, right, yeah. Right, right, in moral intuitions. And I think this was a huge, like, uh, thing for me to come across, like, fairly recently in terms of, like, how I view political differences and, like, the, the extent of uh, polarization in our country that, like, is obviously on display with the last election. Um, I mean, so I think, you know, it's pretty clear um, from, you know, everything you've said, and I think just from um, being attuned to, like, the, the wrongdoings of, of the left, if you will, like, you know, what, you know, the, the, the kind of reactionary, um, like, well-meaning um, and, uh, like, kind of morally, like, righteous and, and well-intentioned, like, uh, you know, behavior of those on the left. Um, but now, so then, like, what can, what, what can conservatives do also? Like, obviously on the left, like, like People, it'd be good if people on the left were more attuned to like how conservatives think, right? And it, which is tough when you don't have the same moral intuitions. Um, so, what are your suggestions for both sides, basically, to like fix the issue of polarization, which is I think generally bad for everybody? I'll go further than moral intuitions. They're m morally ignorant. There is a pervasion of moral ignorance in in the West. And this is because we have an incoherent uh, moral framework. So we talk about values, and someone says, well, I value this. And someone says, well, I value this. And I guess, well, oh shucks, I guess we just, well, we're just not even communicating with one another, are we? And it's because in the classical framework, there was a good for man. It was understood that there are the virtues, and there, there's virtue, and there is the good for man, and life has a purpose, 
and uh, life has a coherent narrative to it. And that's all been exploded by the, by the modern era, the last 500 years or so. So that now, it, it's not just that the left doesn't understand the right, or the right actually does sort of understand the left, but not perfectly. It's that we're not even talking to each other. We're, we're using the same words, but they don't mean the same thing. We are like bar, 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 like, you know, roving savages or something. We're not actually having a conversation. And this is because of the shocking degree of ignorance and lack of culture. Uh, it, it is, I don't mean this even in a hyperbolic way. People don't read anything. And I'm not just talking about everybody. I'm not talking about, you know, the, the great unwashed masses, you know, as, uh, as people deride their fellow countrymen. I'm even talking about the self-appointed elites. You can graduate from Yale University with a major in English and not read Shakespeare. And not read Shakespeare. You can, I, oh, yes, I graduated Yale. Best English department in the country. Summa cum laude. Oh, yeah, what'd you think of Hamlet? Huh? No, I didn't. No, we didn't do that one. We didn't read that. That is a horrifying thing. And so what is required there is uh, humility. It, uh, an important virtue is humility. But we don't have any humility now. We have shout. We have pride. There are all of these pride, not just for uh, gay pride, but all of these other pride marches. We have shout your abortion. We, it's just various displays of, uh, of yelling and of hubris. But really what is required is humility, to realize that we don't know very much, that our culture has lost something profound and important. And if we even want to be able to speak to one another, we have to recover a little bit of that, or at least understand what it is that we've lost. We have time for two more. Hi, so uh, if the inevitable blue wave that we always hear about comes in 2018, uh, do you think President Trump will, govern, will end up going back to his Democrat tendencies and govern from the left, or do you think the media and uh, the left have pushed him too far? Well, do you think that inevitable blue wave in 2018 is going to come after the inevitable victory of Hillary Clinton in 2016? You know that inevitable victory that a study from Princeton University said was going to happen with 99% certitude the week before the election, and then, no, whoops, it didn't, and actually it was an electoral landslide for Donald Trump? Certainly history shows us that uh, Democrats should retake the House, if not all of Congress, uh, this cycle. That's just sort of what happens. And Donald Trump has a lot of forces against him. He has more opposition than your average president. So that should happen. Uh, that said, I'm not really convinced that it will or that it'll be some wave. What they do on the left is they use the vehicles of the mainstream media that we can't get access to, and they use uh, public opinion polls, and they use commentary to shape public opinion. They say it's inevitable. It's inevitable, Republicans. Don't even, why would you even bother going out to vote? Don't even bother. It's a waste of gas. You know, gas is expensive. Stay home. That's fine. Then, it turns, then we win. Then we all go out and vote, and then we win. So I'm not, I, I'm not convinced of that premise. If, uh, if the Democrats retake the Congress or something, and Donald Trump feels that he has to move more to the center to govern, uh, I suppose that would be possible. But I don't give Democrats enough credit for that. Because that would be the smartest thing they could possibly do, is to try to make a deal with Donald Trump and be nice to him and uh, compromise and have an art of the deal. But they're just too thick for that. They just won't do it. They hate him in such a bizarre, visceral, irrational, screaming, no kind of way that they, I don't think they could bring themselves to do it. And moreover, I don't think their base would allow them to do it. They've ginned people up into hysteria for so long, hysteria that proved completely pointless and untrue and unfounded. And I, I don't think they're going to be able to, to pull them back to any practical uh, uh, governing coalition. It's getting recorded. So. Yeah, you might not need a mic, but I need you to have a mic. <laughs> Um, so I was just a bit confused about the terminology that you were using earlier, and I was, uh, you could clarify this for me. So um, you talk about the left perverting culture, right? Um, and I'm curious. And then later on, you use the term "our culture." So I'm curious as what you mean by "our culture." Is it the West? Is it your culture? Is it the left and the rights? Is it American? I, I'm not sure. We share a culture. We share a culture, and obviously, some of us. 
Look, if, if we're here at the University of Pennsylvania and people are wearing bow ties and we're having nice, polite conversation, that is a different culture than might be happening in downtown Detroit on some awful block right now. That's certainly true. But there are different cultures. There are local cultures and state and it gets a little bigger. And we have a Christian culture, uh, the Christendom or the Western culture. Certainly that's all true. The, the important point here is that cult, culture and cult derive from the same word. They come from the same place. And uh, that's because what the culture worships will define it. If a culture is, worships money, it will be more materialistic. If a culture worships sex, it will be a little more licentious. And our culture does both of those, and that's not bad all the time, you know, if it's a, a little bit in moderation, but it's, it's clearly gone to excess. Uh, that is the, that's what I mean by our culture or national culture or, or whatever. There are obvious layers here. And uh, what we have to do is decide what the culture is going to worship. Uh, in a, uh, not to proselytize to you too much here at the end of this, but it's a really important cultural and philosophical point, which is that uh, Moses asks God, he says, who will I tell them that you are? And God says, tell them I am that I am that God is, the, God is being. You, could, there is, you couldn't say it more simply than that. And when a culture grounds itself in the I am, uh, Jesus says in the Gospels, before Abraham was I am, in the, the present am. When the culture grounds itself in the I am, it, it knows who it is. And when the culture doesn't ground itself in the I am, when it divorces itself from the I am and all of the blessings that this Christian civilization has given to us, you're left only with the pathetic question, who am I? And people try on various identities and they create different fads and passions and ideologies and this week I'm a vegan and this week I'm a crossfitter and this week you know, I'm this, that or the other thing. And all of those identities are unsatisfying because they're not essential. They don't, they're not from the I am. And so my word of advice for the culture writ large, my word of advice for the popular culture is hire conservatives like me to be in the movies and to write the movies. And my advice for the popular culture writ large is to look carefully at what it's worshiping and who it's worshiping. That's the only way to get it on the right track and it's therefore the only way to get politics back on the right track. All right. Thank you all so much. Um, did you wanna... Just to close out tonight, I want to thank everyone again for coming out. What a fantastic conversation. We thought uh, almost hopelessly that the conversation with Michael Knowles might be a little more ironic, um, but that was a fantastic ex series of exchanges. It was very truth-seeking. Uh, thank you again for coming. Thank you to the CN, the LI, the ISI, uh, and all of our subscribers for making it all possible especially the pizza and the lights. Yeah, thank you so much to all of you. The questions were very thoughtful and, and thought-provoking, so thanks very much. Proceed again to statesmanonline.org. Smash that subscribe. Pound that donor button. And finally, everyone, take pizza and your favorite copy of The Statesman on your way out. Thanks for coming. Thanks. And thank you, Michael Knowles.